Coming up next on this week in computer hardware, is NVIDIA about to crush the Radeon 7000? AMD's got a prescription for speed, Intel 520, Sandforce on steroids, four monitors on one GPU for 70 bucks, Connect for PC, GPUs for tiny cases, and Windows on ARM. It's different. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 156, recorded February 9th, 2012. AMD's Natural Performance Enhancement. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by a man I believe who was actually at home this week, Mr. Ryan Shrout of PCPer.com. How you doing, man? I'm um, doing pretty well. How are you? I'm enjoying the uh, the lull in between episodes of Techzilla and doing hideous things to innocent hardware for the sheer unbridled joy of it. Found a water cooling kit uh, that That's I hadn't good. played around with in a while in the uh, storage room in the great cubicle shuffle. And... Uh, <laughs> trying to figure out something else I can water clock. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I said it. I'm going to water clock, or I should say, I should say, uh, water cool uh, the server, which already has a perfectly adequate silent cooler. But hey, why not introduce the risk of epic failure in the most important box in your house? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Actually, now that you mentioned it that way, I would say don't do that. <laughs> but uh, if it doesn't sound that important, I say go for it. So. I think I may have a Core i5 box that'll be perfect for it. Twitch at twit.tv is the email address if you've got a question for us. If you're not familiar with the show, we talk about computer hardware here, what to do with it, which to buy. We talk about the news, we take a break, and then we come back with your viewer questions. we got some good ones for you today. Last week, Mr. Shrout was not able to attend our little weekly podcast because he was sitting down uh, with dinner, I believe, with, with some of the top of brass at AMD. So we covered some of the basics, but what did you think of the of the big announcements uh, from AMD last week? So yeah, I don't want to I don't want to like duplicate kind of what you guys discussed uh, last week, and I listened to um, uh, the show to, to kind of get what you guys touched on. Um, what what I kind of wanted to to kind of mention and throw out there was this idea that I came away from this analyst day that AMD as an as a company was drastically changing and transitioning, right? You guys talked about the, the good chance that all the processors released after 2012 or 2013 are going to be APU only, um, right. even in the server market where, you know, we might be able to find ways to utilize those GPU resources even better uh, than just gaming on the PC. And talked about ultra-thin notebooks and that type of thing and how they were trying to compete with the Ultrabook without actually saying the Ultrabook and that kind of deal. Um, but... You know, the, the CEO is brand new there. The CTO is brand new there. A lot of the top executives are brand new over the last year, 18 months. And because of that, we see, I think, a really dramatic shift in the company at its core, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the impression I got was they don't, they're not going to say this. They may not be happy about me saying it. They're, they're, they're giving up on high-performance computing in the terms of, we're not going to try to compete with Intel to beat their Sandy Bridge E processor anymore. They are comfortable with their placement in terms of performance, and they are going to instead shift and try to uh, use their advantages, their technological advantages, in particular their GPU architecture, and try to make a better company out of that as a whole. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you know they gave some some specs might have been off the cuff, may not have been completely 100% true, but they would say. You know, to get that extra 5% of performance out of a CPU takes 20% more development time. And when you compound that over and over again, when you look at a company the size of AMD and with the financial complications of AMD, you could see why they maybe had decided to, to not kind of push down that route anymore. Um, instead, what you're that. seeing... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that, that kind of affects performance for enthusiasts that is, is uh, changed by their direction internally is that they're going to 
to really become a modular company. They want to they want to build their company around the idea of SOCs. Um, so mm-hmm. they they want to build modular CPU cores. They want to build modular GPU cores. They want to be able to integrate third party IP into their processors when needed or requested by customers. And mm-hmm. they did admit that there are, you know, you do leave three to five percent. <clears throat> performance on the table when you design to be modular instead of designing to be, you know, designing one whole chip at a time. You lose a little bit of that capability to design for high performance. Um, right. Uh, so it's, it's interesting, you know, they, they kind of alluded to a lot of things. Nobody, they didn't announce ARM, uh, partnerships with ARM or anything like that, which is kind of what some people would kind of theorize would happen. I still believe it will happen. Um, mm-hmm. I, I believe you'll see some customer decide that they want to pair ARM processors with ATI, AMD graphics technology and compete on the level that what NVIDIA is doing as well with Tegra. Um, but you're also going to see, you know, they talked about partnerships with companies that have their own IP. Think of a company like Samsung or Sony that may own and build everything from refrigerators to TVs to laptops to PCs and all that stuff in between. They have their own custom IP wouldn't it be cool if you had a unified customer experience, unified user experience across all of those devices? Uh, sure. And by allowing that type of company to integrate their IP with an x86 processor and a high-performance GPU, you know, relatively speaking, on a, on a die, and you can do that across tablets to desktops to TVs, then you start to think about some really interesting ideas. And they had, they had, you know, they have grand visions and grand plans, uh, but <laughs> from our perspective, it's it's just it's interesting to think of AMD as as shifting in that way. My right. the last thing I'll, I'll touch on about that is I worry that uh, that they they still claim that GPU design and architecture and performance is key to producing all of those waterfall effects down the line, getting their GPU technology into their high end desktop processors, and then getting into mid range stuff, and then getting it into lower end, you know, like a tablet form factors and on down the line. So they still say they're going to commit to developing uh, GPU architectures. What I worry, though, is that now their main competition is not going to be NVIDIA as the discrete market shrinks. It will instead be Intel on the processor side. And if they're not getting pushed as hard by Intel on the GPU side, that maybe we'll see a little bit of slowdown on the GPU side. I don't think we have to worry about that for at least a handful of years uh, because so many things are already in the pipeline there. But uh, for an enthusiast standpoint, questions on that and worries on that. So that, that's kind of my takeaway from AMD, but it's interesting. I would almost say I would, I would almost worry more on in terms of Intel pricing without ARM's pressure there or without uh, AMD's pressure there. And, and also as an observation, I'd be really nervous if I were AMD because if they're, if they're sort of targeting the unified interface across like appliances and, you know, smaller computer devices or in-dash entertainment, then all of a sudden... You know, I think his arm picks up performance, and I, I just, I, 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 I wait with bated breath to see where AMD is in five years. I mean, you know, yeah. I also know that people running AMD are probably smarter about this than I am. <laughs> it's, it's one of, it's, it's interesting. The, the, the executives were up, very upbeat. They're very enthusiastic. It's a different kind of feel to the analyst day than any ones I'd been to uh, before. They seemed very, I don't know. They seemed full of energy and. Maybe they were fooling us all and they did a really good job if that's the case. But I got the impression that these people uh, really believe in this new direction. They've had a lot of shift and a lot of changes. And uh, we'll just have to see what, what happens moving forward. So it'll be interesting. In a more cheerful AMD note, the AMD Veritatrol 1 gigahertz prescription pills arrive at PC Perspective. <laughs> A.K.A. Ryan's got a habit. <laughs> What's going on with yeah. this? I mean... Uh, this is PR bluff. In, yeah, in, that's in, all it is. In the best it's, way. <laughs> it's marketing. So they, I, I got an overnight package sent to me through UPS today, and I, and I, the guy handed it to me, and I was like, oh, that sounds like, sounds like pills. That's weird. Um, open it up, and you get this container uh, that was actually full of jelly beans, not actual drugs. Uh, although <laughs> I don't know, they could be caffeinated jelly beans. They could be energy jelly beans. I'm not really sure. Uh, just kind of, you know, Drive gorilla out of the intern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Always start there. So there, you know, uh, prescription for your benchmark rig, use only as directed. 
for natural performance enhancement. Give one tablet by fan intake four times daily. 28 of them, obviously referring to 28 nanometers uh, and that kind of stuff. Interesting. You know, they're, they're not announcing the products with this, but if you look at some of the numbers on here, 905-555-7770 is the phone number on it. So you can probably guess what product it is they're referring to. Um, mm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and they're good jelly beans, I guess. So they had that. This is it's just a taste of some of the odd stuff that uh, PR and marketing does to try to get people's attention. Meanwhile, like we had actually almost completely finished testing for this new card anyway. Um, but uh, everybody here enjoyed the jelly beans, so that's good. Yeah, you're you talking to somebody who received a box full of cupcakes uh, today from a software vendor, which is like kind of an unusual spiff, uh, an unusual gimme to come from a software vendor. I was a little everybody excited, likes, actually. Oops, sorry. I was say, but everybody likes cupcakes. Everybody likes cupcakes, especially my coworkers, all of whom now owe me favors. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Intel 520 Series SSD, you got the full review. This is interesting, right? We, we were all kind of thinking like, okay, Intel's pushed the SSD. They've driven the FSSD market. Now they're going to sort of... Well, actually, it looks like they're going to actually compete with the big critters uh, in terms of... Well, um, it, what's interesting about this particular review or this Ryan particular product, yeah, you were cutting in and out for me there. I don't know. Sorry, I, yeah, I completely lost you for like 15 seconds. Sorry. Should we begin? Yeah, the, well, the 520, what's interesting about the Intel 520 SSD is it's not an Intel controller again. Um, right. This is actually a Sandforce controller, so uh, they're going head-to-head -head against the likes of everybody from OCZ to, to Corsair. Um, but you think about it, this is really the biggest name in terms of uh, reputable manufacturers, right? So people, people have a lot of faith and trust in the Intel name. And uh, one of the reasons Intel is maybe considered late to the game with this particular controller, with this particular generation of SSD, is that mm -hmm. they said they put a lot more time and effort into qualification and testing of their, of their controllers and of their firmware. Um, now, obviously, that's not something you can really test until a lot of these drives get out in the wild and or you spend a lot of time with a particular drive, right? We're talking about we've had these for a week or maybe two weeks after coming back from CES. Um, so we're basically testing performance. We don't get a whole lot of chance to, to look at reliability and that kind of stuff. Uh, but this is, this is the, the Cherryville SSD that had kind of been discussed back and forth for a long time from Intel. And it was rumored mm -hmm. that it was going to use Sandforce, but... Now you know for sure that it actually is. The only kind of performance difference, uh, there are minor performance differences on this compared to other Sandforce drives just because of the Intel tweaked firmware. You're getting a little bit higher IOPS and that kind of stuff. Not super dramatic, but you're getting uh -huh. enough that if these were the same price, you would say, oh, I'll just go with the Intel uh, because you get right. the idea of higher reliability, if not actual higher reliability. And uh, a little bit better performance. The problem is, is their prices out of the gate are still higher than what you can get an OCZ drive for or Corsair drive or whoever it is you want to buy from. Uh, if we look at their price per gig on the last page, you know, $229 for the 120 gig model versus $190 for that same capacity from the OCZ Vertex series. So you're talking about a $40 difference on a $200, $200 drive. So you have a, a healthy percentage difference uh, there. So, you know, I think... But it's Intel. <laughs> exactly. And, and I think for consumers, that won't matter a whole lot. Maybe for businesses in the server world where that $40 per drive isn't going to mean much to them in terms of cost, but they would like to lean on the, the name Intel and the reliability that, that maybe they'd, they'd like there, um, that they, they may lean towards the Intel 5. It's... It's kind of interesting to see the, um, I guess, this brings some validity to the Sandforce lineup. A lot of people had expressed worry about the new Sandforce controller and, and reliability issues. And I, I do take a little bit of comfort, even in my own Vertex 3 drives, right. knowing that Intel felt comfortable enough with this controller to release their own drive with it. Does that make sense? It's kind of yeah, a... Kind circle way of getting back to that but um, <laughs> it's good for the market as a whole that intel is kind of jumping in and backing this whether or not it takes sales or increases sales for a company like occ and corsair and, and uh 
Kingston and all those other guys that are using these drives will has yet to be seen, but should be pretty interesting. Speaking of interesting, the uh, Galaxy MDT GeForce GT 520 has got written up on PCPro.com. Uh, you know, the, the, the opening deck, the opening uh, line on that pretty much sums it up. Four displays for under 70 bucks. Um, it's a small card. It's a 520, not what your GT 520 that you're thinking about is like a full high-end chipset. And it's not. It's a 70 bucks. Um, and, and I like this line. Galaxy is the only NVIDIA partner that is really taking this market seriously. What's this market? Well, multiple display technology. It's the MDT and the Galaxy MDT GeForce GC520. If you scroll down a few pictures, you get to the point. Not the uh, two DVI ports on there, but those big honking dongles. Um, yep. And if you're looking now they're for... Not, no, they're not DVI ports on the front of it, though. They are oh. kind of the, the specializing C... Uh, if you, there you go. You can see in that picture there that it's it's not a standard DVI port. You are if you plug in a standard DVI connection, you are breaking something. Um, that would be bad. <laughs> don't do that. But you, you might have seen those same connections on uh, systems from Dell, like business based sol solutions and stuff like that, uh, a long time ago, where you first right. were introduced to multiple displays on a single card. So you get these. It comes with these two dongles now that makes the card look a lot beefier than it actually is. Right. Uh, but you do get support for four 1920 by 1200 displays, which is nice. You know, technically it supports physics, it supports CUDA, it supports DirectX 11, but this is not, um, to, to sound like Ryan for a moment, this is not a, a gamer's solution. <laughs> it's not, it's <laughs> not. You know, it, the GT520 is not high performance GPU. And, you know, you can, you'll, you can play some games, you can play some 16 by 10 games in, in a, at low settings. We were, you know, we did... Uh, do a little bit of benchmarking. Let me see what games we actually used. Uh, we, we were able to play Skyrim at 16 by 10. Um, StarCraft 2 was fine. Those types of things. Uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution ran at about 30 frames a second. I mean, you, you can do some light gaming. Don't expect to play Battlefield 3. It's not going to be playable on this type of thing. Um, <coughs> and the multi-display for gaming is something that they, they kind of advertise and push. But unless you're playing uh, an RTS game like StarCraft II or League of Legends, that kind of thing, um, then you can might be able to utilize the two monitors. But with especially with any kind of first-person game, having your aiming reticule in the very middle of the bezels is is not ideal. So <laughs> it's it's an interesting card, right? And and the the ability to run four cards for you know I think the only place it's for sale today is Best Buy. It'll be at other places later, so it's a little bit more expensive because it's it's a retail establishment right now. Um, but you know, you can still get AMD cards at this price range that will support three displays out of the box. Uh, so there's there's a little bit of options going through that way. And because um, you could actually buy some, you know, if you get any random NVIDIA card, if you go down to the G210 or the GT220, which might be half the price of this card, you could buy two of them and install that and get four displays that way. It all just kind of depends on your particular system configuration and uh, what requirements you have, but it's a it's a it's a good little card uh, that is unique. And the the Galaxy MDT series is by far the most interesting series of cards on the Nvidia side currently, because they are supporting three, four, and even five displays, whereas mm -hmm. the rest of the market is really kind of limited to two on single GPU solutions. So pretty interesting. Do you run a lot of multiple monitor? I mean, I know you have like twenty four monitors in the office, but primarily <laughs> work single monitor per desktop. Um, all of my systems have at least two displays. So uh, my system at home has two 30-inch monitors. My system here has two 30-inch monitors. And our video editing system has two 30-inch monitors. And that's kind of like our minimum configuration is two displays for anything. Our streaming machine that, that Ken is sitting at now is two displays, two 24-inch uh, monitors kind of stacked on top of each other. Um, I, I, I think for people... It's kind of like uh, moving from a hard drive to an SSD. It's hard to describe the difference. But once you see it and notice the difference of how quickly your applications open, you realize why people want SSDs. And I think if you give a guy a second monitor for two weeks and then take it away from him, he will probably fight you to, to keep it. Because once you get used to having this real estate, it's, 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 like, uh, it's, it's a totally different type of computing experience. I, I, I know... It, a big difference between working on my laptop on the road versus working at home and being able to move between Excel sheets and graphs and text on articles and all this other kind of stuff and Photoshop being open and, and having my uh, 
communication windows open and email all visible at the same time. And and I think a lot of people a lot of people will like that. And I, so I think a lot of people that are looking to use four monitors, which is probably not a ton of those people, but uh, monitors are getting cheap, so it might be worth looking into. There you have it. Yeah. <laughs> no, an, another. An, I was going to say another like Nvidia news story is this whole graphic Kepler graphics card lineup leak. You know I, what do you? I mean, this is. Oh, I asked, nobody really knows. It seems pretty pretty likely that these leaks might be happening on purpose uh, from Nvidia at this point. I think I don't know. It's 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 it comes down to whether or not you believe a graphics card company is cruel enough to leak details of impending cards into the media in an effort to sort of poison the well for their competitors' existing cards. I mean, is is, it, is that what we're coming down to right now? Yeah, <laughs> and it's are they willing to do that, but also know that they're poisoning their own sales as well? Yeah, you know, I, I it's how it's, vindictive a company are you really? Is what it oh, is what it man. is. I'm a, I don't feel like calling NVIDIA or AMD invicti- invictive, <laughs> vindictive um, right now. I, I would tell you, I can tell you right now in my uh, dealings with their marketing teams, they are both very much so. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so, so some of the, there. there is, there is. So here's what's interesting. This, this rumor, this leak, if it, I don't know how, I don't know if it's validity, it's validity at all, but it details like everything. About this lineup from the GTX 640 up to the GTX 690 dual GPU card. And uh, some of the interesting things to look at, the GTX 680, which is the high-end card that will be the highest-end single GPU card. GK110 is the code name. 550 square millimeters die, which is huge, especially considering we're talking about 28 nanometer GPU. Um, and I think somebody was saying the, the I think it might say below there, uh, the 6.4 billion transistors on that on that single GPU, if that's correct. 1,024 stream processors, which is double what you get on the GTX 580 today. Uh, double on the SMs and ROPs. With a 512-bit memory bus, which is twice the memory bus of uh, that exists in the 7970 today from AMD. So there's a lot of interesting specs and numbers and clock speeds that are all kind of guesses. You can see even the <laughs> even on the table. It has tilde uh, in front of it going, like, eh, we think it might be somewhere around 850 megahertz. And chances are it's true. If this leak is true, NVIDIA doesn't really likely know what their uh, clock speed is. <laughs> Two gigabyte frame what buffer is interesting considering the 7970 has a three gigabyte frame buffer. And as people in general think, uh, bigger numbers are better just across the board. Uh, interesting to see if that's kind of a, of a detriment. And then, of course, if you scroll below, you will see the $649 price tag estimated. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know. I still like the $999 price tag on the GTX 690. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. April 2012 estimated. That's pretty interesting. Uh, that's definitely a move in from what we'd heard a long time ago. And they're guessing 45% better performance than the HD 7970. If that's true, that's a lot. That is significant considering that the 7970 was already 30% or so better than the GTX 580. Um, then we will once again be coming into this era of GPU performance being way ahead of anything that the software is going to be capable of doing, which I personally like. I like to see these software developers pushed um, and, and say, well, we've got all this horsepower. Uh, you better do something with it. Uh, and it's spoken like a man who doesn't write software for a living. <laughs> exactly. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Uh, just make it work and make it look better than it did before. Make so. it pretty. You know, and, and Skyrim just released its uh, high-res texture pack as well. So, it, and it's apparently it's changing the way uh, performance on, on graphics cards is working. So, you know, there there are ways to take advantage of this hardware and extra frame buffer and all this other kind of stuff. So, if you're interested in NVIDIA graphics cards, check out this news post that uh, uh, Tim wrote up at our site. If you want to know all of the rumored details on new NVIDIA cards ranging from 139 to nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. <laughs> wow! From uh, not too far from my former home of Linden, New Jersey, from Kenilworth, New Jersey, uh, Main Gear dropped the announcement that their Titan seventeen seventeen notebook with the or seventeen inch seventeen notebook to be the Titan. Is it the Titan seventeen or the Titan I seven? I always get nervous when I start looking at the title of that one. The Titan I think 17. it's the Titan seventeen. Yeah, the Core font is not. 30K Core i7 3960 Extreme Edition 
with fast, intelligent multi-core technology that accelerates performance to match your workload. It delivers an incredible breakthrough in gaming performance. For both gamers and demanding users, the Titan 17 capitalizes on a dramatic leap forward in processing technology to provide all the power you need for even the most advanced games and applications. At least until, of course, uh, the games jump ahead of the available <laughs> GPU technology uh, inside of the... Uh, Board. Although it was, it's interesting because for a notebook, it's the Quadro 5010M featuring up to, quote, four gigabytes of graphics memory and 384 CUDA cores, which actually well, that's, is... Well, that's one of the options. You can also get a GeForce card, the GTX right. 580M. So, I mean... This is a what, big honking gaming notebook. That, that, that's, a, that's, the, that's a desktop processor in there. The 3960X yeah. Extreme Edition is the desktop Sandy Bridge E processor. Uh, like I mean, and, and, and is, according to the clock speeds and the, and the cache sizes and all this kind of stuff, it's there's no speed detriment when compared to the actual desktop version. Like I, it's like they really yeah. actually do are using just the desktop version, which means this thing's going to run hot. Uh, you can look at the pictures on the side of it; it's pretty thick. Probably this is like so two thousand two thousand two, <laughs> where they're like, you know, where they're literally like you said, desktop processor in a notebook. With horrible thermals, you're going to fry your fingertips unless they have an amazing uh, thermal uh, pipe in there. And, and main gear may well because this is a $3,500 notebook. So they're spending, you know, they're spending a lot of your money on this notebook. But the yep. thing that always makes me laugh about this is, is you know, even in the press release, right, which is where you expect giant piles of fluff, battery, removable polymer smart lithium ion battery pack, which is a polite way of saying, yeah, you'll get like 30 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> don't don't there, totally there without that power. Yeah. yeah, but you know you'll you'll you're not going to be like gaming on the plane with this unless they let you carry a freaking deep cycle forty five pound car battery with you, and even then it's going to be about two hours of gaming. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I I didn't think we were going to see these things coming back, and I guess technically they never really went away. But I don't like desktop processors and notebooks. Um, I'd rather just carry well, it's, around. It's kind, of, it's kind of mismatched because the right. 3960 is the fastest desktop processor you can get. The GTX right. 580M is essentially a GTX 560 on the desktop. So there's a little bit of a kind of uh, un imbalance there between the CPU horsepower and the GPU horsepower. Um, whereas this is, the CPU is actually more powerful than necessary, way more powerful than necessary to, to, to push this GPU. Um, now, you can get it in SLI as well, and it says the prices start at $3,500, and I'm guessing they don't end there either. So, Interesting desktop news today coming out. Oops, sorry. I was going to say, desktop replacements at their best. <laughs> I'm just going to not say anything. Keeping my mouth shut is the better part of being polite. It's, you know what? If you want to buy one and it floats your boat... I think yep. the good people of Kenilworth will thank you and the good people of uh, Maiden Gear. Uh, Windows 8 ARM update. Guess what? Your experience on ARM-powered device is going to be different from your experience on, uh, on uh, uh, Windows on Intel or AMD x86. Uh, I was actually looking at a CNET's article on this, and it's, it's really blunt. One thing was made crystal clear today by Microsoft. Windows 8 on ARM will not be the same experience as Windows 8 on Intel AMD. ARM will not run Windows 7 stuff. There will be no virtualization or emulation on ARM. ARM uniqueness, quote, device makers work with ARM partners to create a device that is strictly paired with a specific set of software and sometimes vice versa. And consumers purchase this complete package, which is then serviced and updated through a single pipeline. Uh, labeling to avoid confusion. When a consumer buys a Windows on ARM PC, it will be clearly labeled and branded so as to avoid potential confusion with Windows 8 on x86-64. The PC will come with the OS pre-installed. Uh, WOA will not be available as a software-only distribution Windows on ARM. So you never have to worry about which DVD to install and if it will work on a particular PC. Windows on ARM devices don't turn off and Windows on ARM uh, will include desktop versions of the new Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and OneNote. These are, quote, mm. Office 15 apps that have been significantly architected for both touch and minimized power resource consumption while also being fully featured, says CNET, and providing complete document compatibility. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> It answers, I think, I think it answers a lot of questions. It's maybe not the answers that people wanted, but I think it answers a lot of questions. Uh, you'll get a yeah. desktop environment, but no, you won't be able to run all of your x86 apps. There's not going to be an emulation. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. And if, if you want to get sort of nitty gritty on this, if you go to blogs at msdn.com, uh, um, I want to say Steven Snosky um, uh, did, did kind of basically lay down the law, and it's basically building windows for the ARM processor architecture. And there's a line in here. Doo, 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 doo. Here we go. Uh, this post is about the technical foundation of what we call them for the purposes of this post. Windows on ARM or WOA. Basically, he's in, in making sure everybody understands there's an entirely new category of Windows development jargon. WOA is a new member of the Windows family, much like Windows Server, Windows Embedded, or Windows Phone. Oh, boy. As with those products, WOA builds on the foundation of Windows, has a very high degree of commonality, and very significant shares code with Windows 8 and will be be developed for, sold, and supported as part of the largest computing ecosystem in the world. Basically, what he's making sure everybody understands, Windows on ARM is not going to be the same as Windows on a PC. So, yep. I don't know. My big thing, though, is the Windows Consumer Preview, the beta of Windows 8 on x86-64, will be available for download by the end of February, and that I am very excited about. Yeah, that's going to so. be pretty... I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I have yet to actually install Windows 8 personally myself and try it on anything, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, one last thing before we get to uh, our ad and to our emails is uh, using lasers for increasing hard drive write speed and density. Now, I'm not going to try to get into the detail here of this because I don't understand it as well as I should. Um, if you are interested, you should check out this week's PC Perspective podcast where Alan uh, actually kind of went through it in, in much more detail than I'd be able to do. But the the general idea is that instead of using um, magnetic fields to change uh, polarity of data, they're using lasers to do this. And what it allows them to do is increase capacity and speed. Um, he says to put it in typical computer terms, a gigahertz, a one gigahertz CPU clock triggers every one nanosecond. That is the definition of one gigahertz. 60 femtoseconds, which is the time it would uh, these lasers would allow uh, the, the data to oscillate is 0. 0.0006 nanoseconds. No, four zeros, actually. So um, they're talking about uh, straight line theoretical speed of this technique ranges in the terabytes per second with densities limited only by the capabilities of the nanotechnology used to create the little islands. Um, so this is not anywhere close to a productized idea, uh, but anytime you can get the words nanotechnology in there, it's pretty interesting. So, yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we start talking about femtoseconds, we're in a totally different ballpark here. Um, totally. So that would be interesting. Terabytes per second on your, on your we're not talking about SSDs, we're talking about sto like large capacity storage. So maybe there's a whole other thing to get into past SSDs and standard spinning disks where we have uh, laser disks. Oh, damn it. We already had those ones. <laughs> Lasers. I'm looking forward to the future of LaserDisc is what I'm saying, Patrick. You know what I'm looking forward to? Netflix. When I get looking home forward tonight. to Netflix? That's good. 24 because hours a day. <laughs> 365 days a year. All from the comfort of my couch. 366 this year, I believe. Uh, I hope. I hope they're not February taking off February 29th. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Netflix, what do they allow you to do? They allow you to stream thousands of TV shows and movies directly to you wherever you are uh, <laughs> through numerous different ways, right? So you've got a PC or your Mac. Of course, you can watch Netflix on that. On your iPad, uh, you can watch on your iPhone, your Android phone. A lot of Android phones now support uh, the Netflix streaming app. If you have a gaming console hooked up to your TV, Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii, you can use those to watch Netflix streaming uh, if you don't have any of those, you can actually use a Roku box. You can use an Apple TV. Uh, check your DVD player or Blu-ray player. It might already have support for Netflix streaming apps on there. Um, and if so, you are already already ready to take advantage of this of this offer. So uh, you can try Netflix 30 days completely free through us. We're doing this favor for you. Go to Netflix.com slash twit. 
Uh, and that's how you can uh, get that deal. Look at all these. I mean, there's movies, TV shows. If you're into Glee, I know Patrick. It's one of your favorite shows. I love Glee. Yeah. Um, one of the cool features <laughs> about it that we always mention every week is the ability that uh, I kind of call it like a DVR feature. It allows you to start mm-hmm. watching a show in one place, finish it in a completely other place on a completely other device. Um, it's like DVR upgraded, right? So if you start watching Tron Legacy in uh, in your bedroom at night, you don't finish it. You wake up in the morning, you're taking the bus to work. You can fish it on your phone and your headphones and uh, and do that there. It's, it's, it's a really great service. Um, and like I said, you can try it. 30 days completely free. You can cancel it anytime if you don't like it, but we don't think you're going to have that problem. Netflix.com slash twit is the URL to use when you sign up for that free trial. Netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware and hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. Yes. So you ready to get into a handful of emails for the day? I'm excited. You want to start with uh, Daniel's modeling PC or Aiden's need for old notebook drivers for a new operating system. Well, uh, yeah, that's, that's a typical problem. Let's start with Daniel. He says he works as a technologist at a local university, the Department of Civil Engineering. He has an, uh, he has an, uh, he, let me just read here. I have an academic who requires a PC to do modeling calculations and render 3D graphics for his research. It will be a dual boot system with Windows 7 64-bit and a Linux distro. He wanted to know if a Dell would be the best solution or a custom-built system. We are looking for a system around the $1,500 price range. What do you recommend? I'm not the most familiar with Linux-friendly parts or systems. I love watching Twitch each week. Keep up the good work. PC Pro is kind of one of my favorite websites every day. If only I could afford the dream system on the leaderboard. Fair enough. <laughs> so uh, the, when we start getting into professional-level applications, modeling calculations, and 3D graphics for his research, it would actually be very helpful to know the very specific applications that he's using because... $1,500 is not a lot of money for a workstation class class computer, especially if you start looking at Quadro and Fire Pro cards. Those can cost three to $4,000 on their own. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you know, d- depending on, you can build a pretty good system for $1,500. My issue is going to be in terms of recommending products is that I think you want to stay away from X79 and Sandy Bridge E for probably now, if only because he's going to dual boot with Linux. And with, with Linux, if you want the best compatibility and you want the best experience over, over the long term, you want hardware that is going to be more standard, uh, maybe has been around in the market for a little bit longer. You don't have to worry about driver support uh, being on the cutting edge necessarily. Um, so I think even going with a standard Sandy Bridge platform would be better. Uh, you're going to get a lot of processing performance out of that. And then uh, for the, the 3D graphics, it really depends on what he's using. If it's a GPU-accelerated 3D rendering program, then uh, check and make sure if it can, what specific graphics cards it supports. Does it require Quadro and Fire Pro level cards, or will it work with GeForce and Radeon? If so, that gives you a lot more flexibility. And if it happens to be a um, 3D rendering system that is, CPU bound, like it's only running on the CPU, kind of like Cinebench does and uh, Pavre and those types of uh, benchmarks that we use in our CPU reviews, then, you know, spend more money on the, the you know, the Core i7-2600K or 2700K processor uh, and maybe even do a little bit of overclocking if you're feeling froggy about it and, uh, you know, less on the GPU side of things. Um, there's always, when it comes up to pro-level markets, there's always ways to spend more money. So $1,500 isn't, you know, you're not going to be able to the, the best top of the line, everything. Um, but know exactly what software is going to be running and check, you know, check forums, check Google. What are other people having success with those specific applications, if you know that now? So that, that would be what I recommend for something that sounds like it's going to be a very specific use case. 
Hayden's got a question about old notebook drivers for new operating systems, says hi, Patrick and Ryan. I need help with an old laptop I have, an HP Pavilion DV9705EA, one of the entertainment computers from HP's notebook crew. The keyboard and screen don't work anymore. However, I want to use an external monitor and wireless keyboard with it, and I've been doing so for the past two weeks, but there are some missing drivers, so it's not working out as well as I had hoped. I wiped the drive clean, installed Windows 7 on it as it had Vista before, and I knew just from looking on the HP website, I would not get the correct drive for Windows 7 from HP, but Vista is so bad, I thought it might be worth the risk. So I was wondering if you guys have any ideas on how I can get a hold of the drivers for Windows 7 for the machine, or should I just go over to XP as I know there are drivers for XP for the machine? I would really like to stay on Windows 7 because I love the networking features built into Windows 7. A friend told me to try Driver Genius, but I'm not sure it's the answer to my problems, and I don't want to run on the, the machine before I get advice from you guys. Uh, you know, I was, I was sitting there, I was like, it's an HP. HP's got to have drivers. And, of course, you go to HP's website, and it's Vista, 64-bit Vista, XP in 2000. So where should we start? Are Vista drivers compatible with Windows 7? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> uh, I would say the majority of the time, actually. Yeah, uh, and that was my first thought. was like, yeah. Try rolling in the, the Vista drivers in there. Um, I, I have come, I've come across some that don't, especially here's here's the key for me. Like, I tried to do this with an older Sony laptop, and I was installing. I only had 64 bit Windows 7, and the drivers that they had for Vista were 32 bit, and those are right. not cross compatible. So keep an eye out for that. But right, I mean that's when when Windows 7 first rolled out. That's what a lot of us did is is basically try the Windows uh, Windows Vista drivers. In many cases, they will actually work. Um, Notebook vendors are really funny. Um, there are a lot of cases where the people making a particular component, say a GPU or uh, you know Ethernet or something, don't want to provide the drivers directly. They want you to go to the manufacturer that, that integrated them into a notebook. That said, a lot of the vendors are pretty good about posting drivers you can load separately. So if you can figure out who made the, you know, is it a Broadcom chipset for the Wi-Fi? Is it, you know, what's the controller? What's the USB controller? A lot of times you can, um, you know, track them down one by one. I've never used Driver Genius, and uh, I'm a little, I'm always a little leery of anything that tells me it's going to find me all of my stuff. Driver Genius Professional Edition. What can it do? Find the latest driver for your computer? I, I've never used any of this kind of stuff either, but, you know, I, I went to this website and I was looking at, you go home and, and it shows all, lists all the companies that it supports, all the vendors that it supports, and I went to one like Adaptech. I'm thinking, wow, Adaptech's got to have a ton of stuff, right? So click on Adaptech, right. and it actually lists four drivers, um, which doesn't seem like a And it's lot. 30 it's, bucks per seat for Driversoft, so uh, is that, that's Driversoft, not Driver Genius. I, uh, I don't think, I don't think, well, Driversoft makes Driver Genius, apparently, but I don't I, think, <laughs> I don't think it's going to be able to do anything that you and Google in a couple of hours aren't going to be able to do. Um, right. If the driver exists for it, out there on the web, somebody will find it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you may spend a bunch of time in the forums, but I say just, you know, do it the old school way. <laughs> One driver at a time. And oh, yeah, really absolutely. The Linux. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You don't want to talk about drivers there. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Rate rate How about versus it? monitor refresh rate volume seven. We got an email from Tom. <laughs> you want to take yes. this one? You want me to read uh, I'll as get a it uh, as a heart. Oh, go ahead. Skype, Skype wins again. Skype as a hardware <laughs> and gaming enthusiast, I'm always concerned about squeezing every ounce of performance out of my rig to the highest frame rates possible. Currently, I'm playing Battlefield 3 anywhere between 60 and 90 frames per second with an average of about 80. My question is, does it make sense to push frame rates beyond the monitor's refresh rate, which is typically 60 hertz? Can a typical LCD even display all gener generated frames in these 60 plus higher than 60? Your answer may be a game changer. Wow, that's, that's important. That's deep. Um, so uh, that, that last part, can an LCD display all generated frames in the 60 above 60? It, it can't display all of the frames, but it does display parts of all of the frames, if that, if that makes any sense. If you're playing a game and you have ever noticed um, tearing on the screen where, say, we just 
did a bunch of stuff on this. So if you're looking at a door in Battlefield 3 and you kind of move back and forth across it, you'll see kind of where the, the, the posts of the door don't line up for, for just a second. And that's what V-Sync tends to fix. It's kind of visual tearing. Um, what you're seeing there are portions of frames that the GPU has generated on its side being pushed out quicker than the display is refreshing. So you're getting, you may see portions of three or two or five or 20 frames on the screen at any given time, depending on how fast uh, your, your frame rate is. So if you're seeing frame rates between 60 and 90, then you have, you're playing with V-Sync turned off, which, which gives you a not as great visual experience, but a better experience in terms of kind of uh, twitchy responsiveness and that kind of stuff. So um, depending on what your goals are, if your goals are the best image quality and best visual style possible, then enabling V-Sync and locking it to 60 hertz may be the best option. If your goal is to make sure you're getting the most performance out of your system and your mouse and keyboard are responding as quickly as they should and blah, 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 et cetera, then leaving V-Sync off, you will see, you won't see visual advantages, but you will see kind of, kind of performance responsiveness advantages. Uh, it's interesting that this question came up because we just kind of did uh, a little project here uh, using... Uh, Lucid's technology, we haven't talked about them in a while, actually. Uh, they had a technology called Virtual VSync, which attempts to kind of merge those two things. Uh, right. And you see reported frame rates as if VSync were disabled, but the, that the screen would look as if VSync was enabled and you wouldn't have any tearing. It actually worked pretty well. And the idea is it's handling which frames actually show up, but the GPU and the, the game clock are still working in the background as if V-Sync was turned off. So you're getting the same responsiveness advantages. Um, so that's something you might be able to take advantage of in the, in the not too distant future as well. Um, but I, I think, I think it does make sense for a lot of gamers to push past 60 frames per second. I know I see that. I see that argument all the time on forums I'm getting 70 frames per second while I'm getting 90. It doesn't matter. Your eye can't see any more than 60 anyway. And it's just not, it's just not true. Um, your eye perceives a lot more than just a raw 60 frames per second. And your mind perceives a lot more in terms of smoothness and, and, and stability of frame rate and that kind of stuff as well. So uh, always go for more, more numbers, higher numbers. It's always better. Bigger, better, faster, more. Yeah. Mike's got a good question if you're building the system. He says, I'm using the shuttle SH67H3 with an Intel i5, 16 gigs of RAM, and a 500 watt power supply. I use the system running Linux about 90% of the time and Windows 7 for the rest. I want to update, or excuse me, I want to upgrade from the onboard graphics with one 24 inch monitor to a 3x24 inch 1920 by 1280 monitor configuration. What graphics card would allow me to reuse? The existing case along with two new monitors, or excuse me, reuse the existing along with two new monitors and fit into this case. I've been listening to the show for a couple of months. Your knowledge of the graphics card market seems inexhaustible. Obviously, referencing Ryan there, <laughs> hope you can help me out with this puzzle. So, if you're not familiar with shuttle cases, uh, they're small. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it does have a PCI I'm Express X16 slot. Yeah, I'm kind of curious if it's actually long enough. Here's the global.shuttle.com webpage, and I'll put the link in there for Chad at the mothership. Um, yeah. And and the the you know it's great that it's got a by sixteen slot in there. Uh, Five hundred watt power supply isn't great, but it's a good start. The question mm -hmm. is is where they've actually put that. Basically, how big a card you can physically fit in that spot, and. Mm -hmm. Why do they never have the gallery? There's the gallery pictures. And it might actually be usable. Is it a full-length slot? It's, it's well, um, if you look at the specifications, the, the length of uh, the case itself is, oh, man, they're using millimeters. <laughs> by, by 20. <laughs> so, yeah. 323 millimeters. So uh, you're not going to be able to use uh, a 7970. You're not going to get a card that length. Um, so 323 millimeters is 12.7 inches. Give a little space for probably right. 
fan and connectivity options in the game. You might be able to fit a 10-inch graphics card in this system, in which case your options are going to be fairly open. Um, mm -hmm. Anywhere from you know the 6800 series, maybe even the 6900, I'd say 6800 series, and GTX, I think the GTX 5... 70s and 580s are right around 10 inches as well. So, you know, I think you'd be able to do that and the 500 watt power supply is going to be enough for a single graphics card, something like that. What did he say he was upgrading from again? Um, the stock onboard graphics. Oh, God, yeah. Basically, okay. It has a motherboard built in, so <laughs> anything's going to be know, better it, than that. And he wants to do triple 24-inch monitors, so he wants to kind of go towards the AMD side because he doesn't even have the option to go multiple GPUs, multiple cards uh, with NVIDIA. So I would say, you know, look at a 6850, look at a 6870, um, and I think you'll find cards that will definitely fit in there um, as well. And you might be able to get away with the 6950. I was trying to think that as well. So I'm looking at the 6870 and the uh, details here, see if it gives me a, a PCB length. It does not, of course. But, um, yeah, you know, that's definitely something in a constraint case like that. You want to make sure you check on the manufacturer's site. For the for the PCB length, if you stay around ten inches, I'm guessing you know you look inside the case and measure how much space you have yourself, right? You'll know what if there are fans in the way, if there are hard drives in the way, if there's something else in the way uh, inside that inside that case. You need to know before you <laughs> shell it for a graphics card. So, I also could remember working with some of the early shuttle cases where you would practically have to tear the case. We I think in one case we actually took a couple pop rivets or basically you know cut sawed into the case so we could slide the card in. <laughs> I, I think shuttle's gotten a lot more generous with the space inside of their cases since then. But um, yeah, just, just be patient and get ready to get some measuring on. <laughs> I think we got time for one last one. Should we do something a little different? Talk about uh, connect for PC. Sure. Or uh, Allison says, I'm a big fan of your podcast. Woohoo! Thank you, Allison, which I just noticed recently. Hopefully, you'll keep listening. No other show that I know of anywhere covers GPU, computing, noise, case design, water cooling, and such like. They're all obsessed by tablets and phones now. Trust me. Ryan and I are obsessed by tablets and phones. We just keep it elsewhere, <laughs> which is a, is a welcome breath of fresh air. Thank you, Allison. Question, did I hear you say that Connect Light control systems for PCs will be coming out soon? I'm dying to know more. A smaller depth of field camera like the one for Windows 8 as opposed to the longer depth of field one for the Xbox is of great interest for automotive applications. And a matter of fact, uh, yes, Connect for the PC was announced at CES. Uh, more importantly, Connect for PCs, uh, uh, what is the, the language I want to use for this? Um, <laughs> the, the, the SDK um, was released or announced at, uh, at CES. I don't think it's shipping yet, though. Uh, um, it is. Yeah, no, I think, I think it is. February 1st, think it's actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me go to Amazon.com. If it's on Amazon.com, it's shipping. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It's supposed to ship uh, February. Much what but I you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's uh, <laughs> Connect for CP is not the right thing to type in. Connect Sensor for Windows by Microsoft February 1st, 2012. Uh, usually ships in one to two months. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Sold out. 250 bucks. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm very very curious to see what what's going to happen with this. There was already kind of a, a really strong underground hacking community with Connect, and right. now they don't have to to be so underground, uh, right? They, that's the whole idea. Okay. And the the hardware changes are actually pretty interesting, right? So they they have a a wider angle lens. So the idea is, most of the time, people working on a computer are much closer to the screen than uh, when they're gaming in front of their TVs. So. I'm imagining being able to do some pretty cool things. She mentions uh, specifically here the um, automotive applications. I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Um, what was the? Uh, I guess in Jurassic Park they had the guy with the with the gloves who's moving the model around and that kind of stuff. And it's like now you, you'll be able to do that. You don't have to wear the stupid gloves either, uh, which, <laughs> which is which is really cool. Um, I hope I don't have to get up and stand behind my computer and dance or anything to get stuff done, but. <laughs> interesting to see eye tracking head tracking all kinds of interesting things they could do maybe integrate it with some really cool uh teleconferencing and video conferencing stuff as well um should, should be should be neat i hope so i hope so 
Do you have any, you have any uh, dream it's... use cases for something like the Kinect? Uh, something that'll entertain my son and teach him how to do math faster than I can while tiring him out through physical sort of exertion. <laughs> Jump, jumping <laughs> math game. Gotcha. Okay, we can handle that. That you know I think I mean? we can. Jumping, yeah. I actually like that. The jumping math game. I have to tell my wife about that. She'll be thrilled. Uh, 42 plus 27. Jump that many times? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's see. Tony? 7,000 versus Kepler or the BFT we'll upgrade? That. Let's do, let's do 7,000 versus Kepler. This is more general purpose here. This is from Cameron. Yeah. says he's a college student with about $200 to $250 budget to spend on a video card in the next two months. I've seen the benchmarks for Southern Islands, and it seems to be fantastic, although maybe people say that Elite isn't a true generational gap. And being the market for something like a Radeon HD 7850 or whatever's in that price for Kepler would be a better plan. My thoughts are that AMD may have rushed release of the 7000 series because it had some indication that NVIDIA would release something much better later on, in which case it would be better to wait. I'd also like to know what percentage gain would you expect in general driver improvements as they mature for the life of the 7000 series. Um, so as he, no as he notes here, there is no Southern Islands GPU in the 200 to $250 price range now. The <laughs> lowest cost Southern Islands GPU today is $449. So quite a quite a bit off there, um, and based on our pill discussion earlier, it would appear that we'll have the seven thousand series. I'm sorry, the seventy seven hundred series out very soon, um, which will be below two hundred dollars. Um, right. So he's going to be waiting a little bit longer for that. Is it worth waiting for Nvidia? It's always it's always better to wait. You know, we talked about our Kepler rumors. And what was the earliest price they had released for that kind of stuff? It, it was uh, April, right? April 2012. Sounds about um, right. Yeah. And, and again, the, again, these are all just rumors that we're reading on the web just like anybody else would be. Um, but the – okay, actually, this, this might affect it. He's, there, there is no $249 or lower part scheduled to be released on Kepler until May, right? May uh, – and maybe even into Q3. So that might affect his opinion on uh, whether or not it'd be worth it to buy now or buy later. Patrick is more of the kind of wait and see type of person. I tend to be the let's buy stuff now type of person. <laughs> it's just uh, it's just a personality difference we have. My GPUs sometimes. like, I, yeah, like, I, you know, I... But you've been known yeah. to buy some hard drives on uh, on a whim as well, so... Yeah, no, yeah, I'm the guy. And actually, it turned out that that, that, was that really you smart. know, random <laughs> twelve terabytes of hard drives uh, that I picked up one Thursday afternoon was was a stroke of genius. Um, yes, since not long after that, Thailand got flooded, um, and my heart goes out to the people of Thailand who, who who suffered under that disaster. But yes, I'm really happy I bought those drives because now I have a big fat server, and uh, it didn't cost <laughs> me like seven hundred dollars for the hard drives it only cost me like four hundred and fifty dollars actually probably would have cost me like twelve hundred if i bought them a month after i did um but yeah no it's 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 i don't know i, I think the rule of thumb is if you can if you're if your gaming isn't suffering if you can last a little bit longer almost if you like if you can wait three months you'll almost always get a healthy bump in performance or a healthy drop in cost for the same amount of money or yeah. you know, the same the same gpu for less money or you know more performance for the same amount of cash um although if if, if the leaks we're seeing from nvidia are legit um then there may be some huge shifts in pricing and performance coming up uh in the none too distant future and and, um, and, the, and the chances the, are if like if you if you if you wait until the seven eight hundred series is released, which is you know the, the, in that price range probably that you're going to be hitting, chances are there will be more rumors and maybe more updated and more accurate rumors on when Nvidia will actually release cards. So if that's the case, then you're better off now just waiting until something is even available and then maybe ask that question again, uh, you know, of yourself saying, well, is it time to buy now or do I feel like I want to wait until May June July? So. Um, and I think a lot of people are going to go going through that decision process in the very near future. So I think I wrap it's, it up for us this week. I think I will. What's coming up on PC Per this week? Um, well, we have video card reviews, of course. <laughs> I bet you I bet you never would have guessed we'd have video card reviews. 
uh, on the website. We've got uh, some good stuff going up this week. We're going to have the Transformer Prime keyboard uh, kind of add-on finally reviewed. We have a good mechanical keyboard roundup from Rosewill with uh, a really, really good explanation of uh, the different cherry key styles and that kind of stuff with custom homemade animations from our own uh, Scott on that. So we've got, we've got a lot of interesting stuff coming up and um, chugging along on our new office space. Uh, have another video up kind of looking at the, the almost completed non-carpeted space that we have uh, built this far as well. So exciting stuff going on here. Uh, never a dull moment. How about on Techzilla? You said you were taking a break in the lull between. So uh, let's been busy. <laughs> yeah, they they uh, they shifted. Uh, they they rebuilt like half of our cubicles to to increase the number of cubicles in our office. Um, so it's been kind of interesting figuring out how to sort of stack all of my hardware up to make it fit in my cube. That we all realized it was just never going to happen. Uh, they may have done that intentionally to force my hardware out of the office. But yeah, I now have like. <laughs> Two computers and a server sitting on a on a on a desk the size of a lunch tray, and it's a little awkward. <laughs> but uh, the Rip Monster Three Thousand will be appearing again next week. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, basically uh, lossless encoding and ripping Blu-rays and how to do it super super fast, like six CDs at a time if you've got a big audio collection. And uh, I'm talking about uh, permanently assigning your data drive. So if you just installed an SSD, you don't want all, all of your stuff on the C drive with your operating system, how to set up Windows so that it automatically writes your stuff to the drive you want it to go to so you're not constantly dragging and dropping files around your operating system. It's hey, that's important. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Yeah, we, we try to keep it simple on Techzilla. And, uh, <laughs> try to keep it real, man. That's the only time I'll ever flash a gang sign. I don't think these are gang signs. I think I was throwing the horns, getting my rocket. Yeah, no, you're safe, man. <laughs> you can never <laughs> be too careful to living really close to Oakland, but... I drive through Oakland to safe. go home every single night. <laughs> <laughs> Which, All right, and uh, also, just, don't forget, everybody, uh, twitch at twit.tv is the email address. I don't know if we mentioned it earlier. T-W-I-C-H at twit.tv. Send us your emails and your questions. Uh, any thoughts, ideas, projects you want us to work on, questions you have for us in general, uh, let us know. We, that's what we live on, what we feed off of. So uh, keep sending them this way. We can do this alone, but it's not nearly as much fun without you. No. <laughs> <laughs> and we're just two guys sitting here talking to each other just once a week. Yeah, we could do that over the phone and it would be much less painful. <laughs> Skype fail. Oh, my goodness. Have you tried out the new HD version of Skype, the uh, the 720 version they've been touting? Uh, no, I guess not. <laughs> uh, we're, we're using we're still using like a 4.2 version so that we can use DV cams and HDMI input cards. So I avoid change as long as possible. In this particular aspect of your tech life. <laughs> and on that, Ironic, great, yes, yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Uh, this is the uh, the previous video. We just did we up did we make the other video public yet, Ken? Yeah, we have another video that shows our new completed paint job on uh, the office. I th actually think it looked turned out pretty good. Ooh. You see all the well, there, there, there was a it was a space with four, and those are all the cables they ran. Four, uh, five separate offices that we had all the walls torn out. Um, actually, a uh, Chad, if you go to youtubecom slash per, I think you'll see the new video that we just posted up today as well that shows um, the paint on it. So nothing as exciting as watching paint dry is looking at paint not drying but has already been dried. Are you excited about the update or at this point you're just desperate for it to be over? No, I'm excited about it um, because we're moving to our own space for the first time. We're going to have like three times as much space and uh, I'm just, you know, nervous about it, I guess. We spend a lot of money buying and, <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. So you see our paint there is kind of like Matching all the colors on the website and stuff. Dry faster, paint. Dry faster. Bright green stripe all the way around. So.
you know, new, new internet, new fiber internet and all that kind of stuff. Trying to do half of it's going to be video studio. Half of it's going to be testing area. Um, so that's, it'll be interesting. Be fun. There you have it. No, I did not spend $1.2 million though, Dale. That is, <laughs> that is a plus. That is a plus. 